Welcome to KSPEC Watches. It's still freaking hot here, but I'm here to answer your questions, the questions you put under the last video. Thank you very much for that. And without any further ado, let's start with the first one. And it comes from G Sarmat 86 And his question is, why the power reserve indicator is so rarely present on automatic watches, either on the dial or on the back? To me, the power reserve indicator on the watch is like a fuel indicator on the car. Yeah, very good similarity because the tension inside your watch is the fuel for the mechanism. And if it's yeah without any tension, it stops like your car. But there is a difference. I mean, if you run out of gas within your car, then you are in serious trouble maybe. But with a watch, you shake it a little bit. By the way, I'm wearing a Jubilee, so you can hear the sound Rolex Datejust just on Jubilee. So this is the major difference. With a car, you might be in trouble. With a watch, you're not in trouble. And maybe this is the explanation. Okay, next question comes from George Nelson. How do you balance your YouTube channel and your journalism job? Also, what beat do you write on? Um, yeah, simple answer. I reduced hours, not only for YouTube, but also for the band, which consumes time and is partly a job, not now because of Corona, but normally. And so I worked 32 hours at the office and YouTube is a full day. And so I band a little bit with rehearsals and, and stuff. And so I think my entire work week is about 45 hours. That's how I handle it pretty, pretty normal, I think. And the second part of the question, what beat do you write on? Um, I had to Google beat in this context. What does he mean? But I think you want to know how to, the, the topics, right? The, the resource. And this is a small company, and so I write everything which is in, need to be written. But I'm more an organizer. I'm more a supervisor for a small team of four journalists now with some freelancers. And so that's my job, organizing the workflow and, and scheduling the, yeah, the production dates and everything like that. And so, yeah, it's a pretty, pretty good job, if you ask me. Okay, next question comes from Seriua. Don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. Um, how and when did you get started with tailoring? This was about seven or eight years ago, I think. And I started with trousers because I was in need of trousers and I had a certain idea what kind of. And yeah, my posture and everything, which is pretty normal, but I wanted it perfect. And so I thought, okay, let's make trousers first. How hard can it be? And I started with a commercial pattern, just bought the pattern and wasted everything. <laughs> the first trousers were, were jokes. And then I altered the pattern more and more and I think trousers five were wearable. And so this was a long way. But if you're interested in tailoring, I think you could really start with trousers because they are relatively easy to make compared to jackets, of course. Okay, next question comes from PMEW UK. Um, I love mechanical watches, but I work with all sorts of electrical tools and I have to de demagnetize quite often. It's a pain and I'd rather not do it, but at the same time I don't like being parted from a wristwatch. Have you any suggestions other than Milgaus, engineer or engineer and the numerous Omegas for a decent anti-magnetic and shock resistant mechanical watch? Paul. Paul, I have a good tip for you, maybe in your neighborhood, you can check out the Smith's Everest. This is the PRS25. This is a very well-made 36 millimeter watch with a decent anti-magnetic cage inside. Um, downside is they are very hard to, to buy because there are only a few pieces in stock often. So it can take some time to purchase that watch, but it's clearly a recommendation. Smith's Everest PRS25. Next question comes from Oscar Gustavo Arcos Ruiz. This is a familiar name. Um, two questions. You have already shown us that you are a man of many talents, but is there something that you would like to learn or do and that you have not yet achieved? And second, in your opinion, which is the most important German watch company, both for its history and for its achievements? Um, talents, talents. You know what? I don't like the word talent. Everything you see here from tailoring to music is basically the product of focus and hard work over years. But to answer your question, yes, I've tried to learn the piano. Uh, about 10 years ago and it was completely frustrating because I was there as a relatively skilled musician with a guitar and then I was the rookie again and this was then too much for me. I couldn't, couldn't learn it so I quit that. And the second is I want to be a better illustrator. And so right now I spend a couple of hours a week yeah, to train with, with ink and graphite and to get a better illustrator. I want to be a better illustrator, damn it. And I'm far away from good but 
um, I'm confident that I can present you in some months or years, <laughs> who knows, a decent drawing, at least that, a decent drawing. But uh, back to that talent, that annoying word a talent. If you want to know the case back watches method, how to pick up new things like music, craft, and everything, then let me know in the comments. Then I produce you a 10 minute video and after that video you will be able to learn everything you want. And the second question, the most important German watch company. Oh, I've, yeah, I've given that a thought, but I don't know. I thought Lange, but the history is somewhat disturbed because World War II and the two Germanys and this, I don't know. And then I thought Stover maybe, but Stover was always, I think, mid-tier. And so excuse me, but I have, I'm not sure. Maybe you can answer this. Maybe other viewers can answer this because you have the the perspective from outside and maybe you're you're a bit, little bit more unbiased than I am. What's the most important German watch brand? That's my question to you now. Okay, next question comes from Dara Rohan. Um, my question is if you would consider buying the Tissot Porto. Um, answer is no, because um, I've owned the Tissot Lisboa. I love it, it's a great piece, but it's a smidgen too big especially if you see the, yeah, the heritage of the watch and the Porto is even bigger and so I think this is a massive rock on the wrist and, and so no, 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 I don't want it, I don't want it. And many people don't want it because it's cheap, it's really cheap if you see it on the used market. Next question comes from Jose F. Gonzalez. Um, what's your opinion on watch heads on other watch brands bracelets? I'm not talking about a replacement parts like strap code, I'm talking about let's say a signed Hamilton bracelet on an on a Omega an Orient bracelet on a Seiko. Seiko, yeah, I've learned that. <laughs> um, I would say this shows some balls. Um, this shows that you're completely beyond this marketing and brand stuff. You see, I want that on that and I just do it. And to be frank, if it looks good, I love it. I love that approach because it shows some liberty in of your mind. And so if you, yeah, if you can manage this, then carry on, carry on. <laughs> Have fun with your, your mixing brands. Next question comes from Peng Xiang Xiam. Wow, that's a name, Peng Xiang Xiam, beautiful. And what's your opinion on social media influencing buyer decision on watch purchase? Oh, minefield. I mean, the thing is I'm sitting in the glass house, you are sitting in the glass house because we are all social media and everybody who shows something on Instagram is part of social media or YouTube and he's influencing other people. But to break it up a little bit or to start, um, I would ask what does he want? or she is what what does he want this particular influencer you're thinking now of what does he want and in case of watches often people want to sell you something you find a lot of influencers on youtube on instagram and they are watch dealers i mean we all know prominent examples of youtube personalities who are watch dealers and people will hate me for saying this but if you want to sell products then you're not longer free you can not longer tell the audience what you want i mean imagine a watch dealer and then he has five similar pieces in stock and then he realized, oh, they're not so great. God, what have I done? They're not so great. And if he owns a big YouTube channel, then it's very easy. He can make a video and he can advertise those watches. He can tell you that's great and that's it. And it's the only reasonable thing he, he uh, should do in that position. And again, people will hate me for that, but it's the connection like heat and fire. It's the, it's the way the, the world goes or take all those watch dealers and often they make um, certain videos stay away from that, that particular model or that line of watches, stay away from that, it's crap. And I'm under the impression they do this when they realize they cannot make a buck with those models. Perhaps it's impossible to get them in stock and so they realize I cannot make any money with that. So I tell the audience it's crap, buy an alternative and it happens to be that the alternative you can't find in my shop. And again, it's a reasonable thing to do, but it has nothing to do with influencing people in a, in a free way. Okay, the next question comes from Ronan. Um, you have an enviable collection of waistcoats and yet don't seem to want to adorn them ever with a pocket watch. Why is that? Am I mistaken? If I am, it would be great to see a review of some old pocket watches and how best to wear them. Gold, silver, gunmetal, etc. Uh, yeah, I've wanted to make a video about pocket watches, I, I know that but I've never done it because I think I'm not so interested to be frank. I don't own pocket watches. I have one, but it's modern, cheap, cheap junk. And um, a pocket watch wouldn't feel natural in a way. I mean, I have some flashy suits, 
but most, most of them I've tailored myself and they're kind of natural. They I feel completely natural in them, but with a pocket watch, this would be the small step towards a costume. And so, no, I think, hmm, give me a little bit more time, please, <laughs> to present you content about pocket watches. Okay, next question comes from Luca Bergamasco, familiar name again, and he asks, Ever had any experience with Chinese watches Watches from AliExpress, 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 I think. The mechanical ones in the 50 to 150 euro range. If yes, how do you think the comp they compare to same class watches such as Seiko 5, Orient, 3 Star and such? Um, very sorry, I've never bought something on that platform. I've never bought them. I've heard so many people that you can make great deals there. Um, but I've heard also rumors about some fakes and so every time I hear the name of this platform I think, oh, mm, don't know, no, please not. There are other platforms I prefer. Next question comes from Simon Gabriel. Hi Tim, what do you think of Farah watches? Yeah, very interesting, very interesting brand. Thank you, I've checked their website. I've never owned a Farah watch and I've never seen one in real life, but I checked their website and I saw colors. A very hard, strong use, a good use of colors. And, um, and the five-year warranty is crazy. They give you five-year warranty of all movements. And this is, yeah, I've never heard something like that. The only thing I thought, um, I couldn't find immediately the focus of the design. There were so many influences and different yeah, ranges. This was a little bit confusing, but it's an interesting brand. And I really love to review one day a watch of them. Maybe I could uh, just write an email asking them if they could lend me a watch for a review. This would be interesting, right? Would be really pretty interesting. So thank you very much for that question. And next comes from Chase Zellers. Zellers, I don't know how to pronounce it, sorry. Are you still doing leather work? And if so, what kind of project projects have you done? Yes, I'm I I'd love to work again with leather, but I have to finish the safari jacket. I'm uh, working so hard on the safari jacket. I've so a little time for it, but it's nearly ready. I'm working on the lining now and buttonholes and everything. And after that, I'd like to produce a new, a new wallet. I've sold the 20 um, Diesel Park Executive wallets. And yeah, this was really fun, except shipping. S shipping was terrible. But now I want to produce first for me, for me, <laughs> sorry, a, a more advanced wallet because I have an old wallet and I realized the, the features of a wallet are not so important. I mean, you want good leather, you want good stitching quality and, and stuff like that, but you don't need fancy features. What you need is the perfect size for the wallet, the perfect size to store cards, the perfect size to put bill in it and, 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 and bank notes and everything and the perfect size so that you can store it in your jacket or in your, in, your, in your back pocket or whatever you like to do. And that's important. And it happened to be that I produced such a wallet 10 years ago, I think, and I realized, wow, this thing, the, the size of this thing is perfect. Just make it better. I mean, the, the quality wasn't there. And so the idea is finishing the safari jacket, then go to the leather store, buy the best leather they have for that purpose, and then make the the wallet, a really puristic, pure, but really good looking wallet in the perfect size. And I don't know if I can make it available here on the channel, maybe, but again, there are some traps and shipping is one of them and uh, I'm not a good salesperson, I think. But let's see, at least it will be fun to do and I will share the product, at least uh, images and explanations and the concept behind it here on the channel, that for sure. Okay, next question comes from Bakayumba and he wants to know, or she, Bakayumba, hmm, who knows? I have been told that you should not store mechanical watches unwound. Rather, wind the watch and pull the crown, heck, when storing for long periods of time. Would appreciate your thoughts. Cheers. Um, I've asked my watchmaker and he was like, what? Why, why, why that? And so I think it's not necessary, to be frank. I think there's not a technical reason to do it. But if another viewer is better informed, then please put it in the comments. Then we can learn something useful from you. Okay, last, last question comes from Brendram Jones and he wants to know, what's your beef with quartz watches? Are there any you like? If so, examples and why? Um, I don't have any beef with quartz watches. I find them rather boring, that's all. But I own a quartz watch, uh, in fact, and this is the Tissot Banana, which I love. But I love the watch completely for the look, for the design, for the flashiness, for the big case and the gold, and it's a really beautiful watch. 
But if I could grab that watch in a, in a mechanical version, I would do it. So if I could choose between them, I certainly would would go with a with a mechanical watch. Yeah. And the good thing is that there is no second hand, and so you cannot see the quartz movement. Okay, this was the last question, and now I have a question for you. I'd like to know something about video length, because on the channel here you may find very short videos. The Watch of the Week video series is rather short. This is part of the concept. This is okay that way. But the regular episodes on every Friday, sometimes they are 10 minutes, sometimes they are 22 minutes, something like that. And I really like to know what is your preferred video length here on the channel. Does it depend completely on the topic or do you say, oh, we can consume 12 minutes but not more? This would be nice if you can give me some hints in the comments. And if you want to see images of watches and other things I find interesting, then please join me on Instagram. It's caseback underscore Tim. And now let me thank you very much for your attention and maybe until next time.